Hello, my name is Christine DiCarlo, and I'm the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicines, or ACOMS, Media and Public Affairs Manager. I'm joined today by Dr. Jordan Spencer and his brother-in-law, Tanner, for a conversation about mental health and well-being among medical students, residents, and health professionals. Mental health has long been a challenge for the medical profession, and the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated these concerns, making finding a solution all the more urgent. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so to help raise awareness of mental health issues and what we can do to guard against them, I'll be asking Dr. Spencer and Tanner a few questions on this topic from their perspectives as a current medical resident physician and medical student. Before we begin, I'd like to invite Dr. Spencer and Tanner to introduce themselves and share a little bit, a little bit about what makes them passionate about this work. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm Jordan Spencer. I am a PGY3, rising PGY4, which is kind of scary to say, um, in a dual program of internal medicine and psychiatry. Uh, I, I'm training in Charleston, South Carolina at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and I went to school at LECOM Erie in Pennsylvania. So the mothership of the LECOMs. Um, and then uh, what brought me to mental health, uh, I don't have a great answer in the sense that it's just kind of where my personality fit. Um, a lot of people when you're choosing your residencies or whoever's out there watching this, um, you find that there's just a place that just feels right, whether or not you can put your thumb on it and, and mental health. And I, I particularly am interested in um, addiction uh, is just kind of where is my happy place. So. Thank you. And you're also, correct me if I'm wrong, vice chair of uh, oh, the AOGME. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm the current vice chair. Actually, I just got ousted. Loud. No, maybe. <laughs> but um, uh, for the last two years, I've been the vice chair of the resident fellow council for um, the AOGME. Um, we're an organization that tries to help give a forum for residents and fellows to kind of balance ideas off each other as well as develop leadership skills while they're residents and fellows so that then when they go into being attendings they they're they're set up for success um so we try to answer a lot of questions especially within the realm of like academic medicine like what what are the opportunities or you know things things of that nature so it's been a really fun um, adventure and um, this next year i'll be serving as the past chair position um so great thanks and anyone listening if you're interested in learning more about that or joining uh i know that you can join on a rolling basis so definitely check that out on our website we can probably add a link in the description for more information about that <laughs> Um, and Tanner, I'd like to invite you now to introduce yourself, um, let us know where you're enrolled in medical school, um, your connection to USA Gymnastics, and your interest in mental health. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Tanner Dowell. I just finished my first year at Midwestern University in Arizona. I was, I've been involved as a gymnast in USA Gymnastics since I was a little kid. I went to college at uh, UC Berkeley and I was on the men's gymnastics team. And afterwards and before medical school, I got involved in uh, judging, uh, officiating meets for the kids and also a little bit of coaching for some high school kids. When I was in college, I had a series of injuries that led to a mental health breakdown. Um, and I had to kind of use a lot of resources. I, had, I needed a lot of help and where to go and who to see and get some tools and it was honestly one of the best things preparing me for medical school, especially during this trying time. Um, I had been through a really rough period. So um, I, I, I hope that we can kind of get rid of that stigma. I can help advocate for people to not be afraid to ask for help and to look for ways to better strengthen their, I guess, their mental health. That's great. Yeah, trying to pay it forward, I guess. Yeah. All right, so thank you both again for joining me today. Um, Dr. Spencer, my first question is for you. Yeah. Uh, and I could be wrong about this, but and please correct me if I am, but I believe that your residency experience uh, where you're training in two specialties at once is a somewhat unique one. 
Um, and I'm wondering if your osteopathic medical education, which if anyone listening doesn't know, osteopathic medicine emphasizes a whole person holistic approach to healthcare, which you know focuses on the mind, the body, and the spirit. Um, so I was just curious if your osteopathic education influenced your decision to pursue both internal medicine and psychiatry together, and if you plan to continue pursuing both of those paths going forward. I love that question. Um, <laughs> so it's actually the reverse. I chose osteopathic medicine because I wanted to do internal medicine and psychiatry. Um, when my wife met me many moons ago now, um, I told her, you know, you know, I'm studying in school and I want to be a, I want to be a DO. I want to be an osteopathic doctor um, because the holistic part of that medical practice just spoke to me. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to go to DO school since early, early, early in my undergrad career. Um, and it was because I, I wanted exactly what you talked about. Um, and yes, I, I wholly hope to, uh, do both people. A lot of times like everyone always just does one or the other. And which one do you want to do? And I, I really want to live right at the epicenter of where those two cross. Where yeah, that's window. great. That's, yeah, I yeah. feel like there's definitely, um, you know, we're just seeing that how important that is for everybody going forward. We have the addiction crisis. Now we have COVID that's just made everyone kind of face mental yes. health realities they may not have had to think about before. So I think that it's very important work. So that should be exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Um, so Tanner, you began your medical education at an extremely challenging moment. And I just wanted to know what your experience has been like entering medical school in the middle of COVID-19. Yeah, so you interview and everything's normal and you plan your medical school and uh, March, a few months before you start, things, uh, everything changes. Um, so it was not what I envisioned. We, I mean, it's been a great experience, but we, uh, we started off uh, very limited ability to go onto campus. Um, we were looking at one to two times a week for either anatomy lab or OMM. And they were very short, maybe an hour, two hours tops in very small groups. We had to enter and exit in certain ways. Um, it made meeting other students uh, challenging. Uh, it definitely made it for a unique experience in that way. <laughs> um, and it, all the way through first year, that really didn't change. We, uh, we stayed pretty true to the one or, once or twice a week. All our exams were online on lockdown browsers. Uh, with video recordings going and uh, some courses had to make adjustments uh, from what I understand from how they've taught in the past just to accommodate the new C the CDC guidelines and uh, keeping everyone healthy. I know it's been we've had just had to pivot in every aspect of life and medical schools not an exception to that so here's hoping that you know things will get a little more normal soon. <laughs> Get vaccinated if you're not already vaccinated and listening. That's a great PSA, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so Dr. Spencer, next question is for you. So you actually conducted an interview back at the start of the pandemic in March 2020. You recommended yeah. that medical students and trainees uh, should stay connected to their purpose as a way to safeguard their mental health. And, you know, it's been over a year now. So I just was thinking, you know, at, as you look back on this year, how did you define your purpose? How do you continue to define your purpose? And have you been able to remain connected to it amid all the challenges of COVID-19? Uh, um, yeah, you, you asked that question and it kind of strikes at my heart um, because uh, depending on the day and depending, depending um, absolutely, and, and other times, no, not at all. Um, it's it has been a a huge roller coaster, um, and when I when I have done a really good job, um, what I've been doing is I actually this is like behind the scenes what I do uh, in my life. So I actually like write little note cards um, and I put them in plastic bags, 
And when the plastic bag gets wet, when you take a shower, you can stick it on the wall and it will stay there for however long. So I will actually write out like mantras or things that I want to ingrain in my head um, on, on these cards. So um, I, I am a man of charity. I'm a man of hard work. I'm a man of excellence is one of those. Um, and so I read that almost every day. Um, and by doing that, you know, there are little moments throughout the day where that will pop in my head when I'm not being one of those <laughs> or, or what have you. Um, I've also on a Kate on, again, it, it's always a very conscientious effort. It is not something that I just like, uh, nothing about reminding yourself of your purpose is passive ever. Um, it just isn't. Um, sometimes you get really lucky. Two weeks ago, I had a dad call and say, you know, he was just so grateful that we had healed his daughter. Essentially, she had come in incredibly manic. We straightened her out over the weekend. And he told me that he thought that he was never going to have his, his, his little girl again. And he did, which was awesome. But you can't count on those. You, you just can't. And that happens once in a blue moon. And when it happens, enjoy it. Remember it. I wrote it down because uh, oftentimes you're not getting those um, spontaneous moments that remind you why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and so I, I wrote down like sometimes in the, in the, the thick of it, like <sighs> patients become, maybe I shouldn't say this, but patients become a name on a list, um, you know, and I, I checked them off and I did it. And um, so to fight that, I, I remember having, I have little check boxes that, you know, did I do this thing, this thing, and this thing for the patient each day? And I made one of my check boxes. Um, it's like, it's write a note. Did you actually see the physical patient? Um, did you put in their labs for the next day? And I made a box that was, did you have a human experience with them? And so when I talked to them, I tried to, I really tried to just, whether we cracked a joke or talked about the weather or something, I just wanted to make it, I, I went into medicine to have human experiences. And I came to the conclusion that I have to make those happen. Um, so. Wow, that's making me emotional. That's really beautiful. <laughs> that's inspiring. I love that idea too, of writing the note and making that a very proactive yeah. exercise. Um, because I know some people say I have a mantra or, you know, they, they write down a quote, maybe in a notebook, I do this and I don't look at it until I feel the urge to look back at what did I jot down? Yeah. But it's not something I look at every day. But I love I love that where you have it right on the wall. So yeah, yeah. That's a, and I'm that's also brushing trip. my teeth at the same time, just so you know. <laughs> I, I brush my teeth in the shower, so I am very. We are going to get things done. I mean, as a resident, you kind of you need to do those time saving yeah. tricks. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're making definitely making the most of your time. That's really great. That's a great answer. Um, okay, so Tanner, my next question is for you. Um, I understand that you're part of a big mental health effort and campaign through USA Men's Gymnastics. And I'm just curious what attracted you to this work, although it sounds like you did answer this a bit earlier. Um, and also if osteopathic medicine's holistic philosophy attracted you to osteopathic med school, maybe it was a little bit of influence from your brother-in-law. What's the attraction to the, to the osteopathic philosophy? Uh, certainly. Yes, uh, Jordan was uh, influential in um, helping me gain a better understanding of what osteopaths stand for. Um, it was something similar and that as a, as a gymnast in college, I had a lot of, um, we, you look for every advantage to get back out onto the field of play. So we used a lot of, we actually used a bit of myofascial release, muscle energy, strain, counter strain, even though I didn't know that's what it was called at the time. <laughs> As I talked to Jordan and I learned more, I realized we were already using some of the osteopathic manipulation and the treatments to better, to be able to get back out there. And then on top of just the whole idea of everything is connected. And so I realized where when my physical health was going, it started impacting my mental health and how strong those two were connected. Um, so I, um, so ideas like that certainly were um, influential and for me pursuing being an osteopathic physician. With USA Gymnastics, 
it is there's still like any other feel or like any other part of our society there is a stigma with mental health and if you seek help it is it looks it can be looked down upon and it can be um or something people don't feel comfortable asking about because they don't feel they understand it enough so they avoid the topic altogether even when they may need help themselves or they can form opinions about other people who talk about mental health or they feel like they should be maybe silent about it or it's a it's a little bit of a it can be a touchy subject and so I had my coach was actually at, at Berkeley he was he's now involved he's one of the head of the men's gymnastics at uh, USA gymnastics um, and he was the first person to help me kind of it's okay to go see someone go get a little bit of help and he was very encouraging now full circle um i'm in school he he's he's he called me up and asked me if i'd be willing to help speak out for mental health in usa gymnastics and encourage kind of that next generation and give a little bit of my experiences and kind of help make it feel easier for people to talk and discuss this top this somewhat difficult topic yeah, that's great. I know it can be intimidating to bring up. Maybe people want to, but they feel, well, what if I'm not qualified? If someone tells me something that I don't know, I don't want to give them bad advice. You know, I, I could see yeah. that being a concern. Yeah. But it sounds like in the gymnastics world, you have like a safe, safer space to do that. And you could tell people if it's something you need to get help for, you can just like yeah. letting them know it's okay. Yeah. 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 It's like, hey, look, you know, you can get to college gymnastics, you can get to medical school, you can do all these things and you can still struggle at some points and it's okay. Um, so now is the physical risks of the pandemic are finally, it seems like beginning to lessen, at least here in the United States. Um, some experts are predicting that the mental effects are really gonna be on the horizon now. And do you both anticipate this being an issue? And if so, what general strategies would you recommend to people who might experience mental health challenges once life starts to ease back to normal and they finally have the space to process the trauma and the grief they experienced? Um, my first bit of advice would be to be as proactive as possible. Don't wait until it's too late with your mental health. It's, it's never too late to start learning some tools and start um, talking about it and talking with others and educating, you know, kind of educating yourself on it and be prepared for the realities of the impact of the um, pandemic. No, I, I think that's spot on. Um, it, be proactive about it. Know that, anticipate it's gonna happen. Frankly, if, if you don't walk away from this pandemic with, with a little bit of, of something, you're, you're not a human. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this has affected everyone. There, there's, not a, there's not a soul on earth that hasn't been affected by this. And if, if you tell yourself you haven't, you're, th you're the person who really needs to be seeing a therapist. Um, I think everyone, so one, I think that um, everyone on earth should see a therapist at least a few times in their life. Um, and I don't think there should be shame in that. Um, all of us have things that we can work through and all of us are trying to be a better version of ourselves. So even if you were somehow perfect, like, wouldn't you want to be more perfect? So um, so right there, you now have permission to tell someone that you see a therapist and it's normal and okay. Yeah, I love that perspective too, because yes, you're right. This has affected all of us. Even, you know, I feel relatively, you know, lucky, but still mm -hmm. you see all the death on the news. It's just, it's constant and it's every day and it's upended everyone's lifestyle. So we've all been touched by it. Um, and I do like the point about having um, the perspective that it will it will reach you because we all will experience grief, whether it's losing a loved one or a pet or you know living through a pandemic. Like it, that is a fact of life. There are challenging moments in it, and it's important to realize you know there are resources out there to help you when you have those those hardships. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is um, kind of getting at both of your individual perspectives. So Dr. Spencer, as a resident now, um, what advice would you give to the incoming resident class on how they can approach their wellness as they start their academic year in July? And Tanner, a uh, similar question from the med student perspective, what would you tell the incoming medical students about prioritizing their wellness while they're in medical school? 
And maybe if there are any strategies um, that you've learned from working with USA Gymnastics uh, that you'd share that they could apply, uh, that might be interesting to hear too. Yeah. So to future interns, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Um, there, is, there is nothing I hate more than an intern who doesn't ask me questions. <laughs> um, you don't know anything and that's okay. Um, that's, that's why you're called the intern. Um, and you're not really expected to know, like to you, you feel like you're expected to know everything and, and good on you. That's good. Cause that's, you know, you want to be in that headspace. So you really push yourself. But at the end of the day, please ask and be open about when you don't know things. A lot of times people, when we're doing, when, you know, when you're doing rounds, someone says, oh yeah. And then the, the one thing with the one thing and everyone's like, oh yeah, uh -huh. and like, you know that like four of them are going and looking it up in, in an hour. Don't play that game. Just because then you can say, you know, I really didn't know about that. Can you tell me? And now you have this conversation where you actually really get to solidify the learning as opposed to going back, trying to look it up real quick on Wikipedia before you do, or just forget that you wanted to look it up because that, that was my classic thing. Um, so ask questions expect that you're again just like what we were saying earlier expect that you're going to fail expect that you're going to fail hard um but then already have a plan in place as to how you're going to react to that who who is it that you're going to reach out to what are the things that what are the things have a list of things that really make you happy so that you can reach for that list and do two or three of those things when this happens or whatever it is um because you prepare prepare for war i mean it's <laughs> It is, it is a battle, it is a battle of, of character. You are being shaped into um, a very unique human um, as a physician. And to assume that that's gonna come without, um, without some stretching again is, is foolish. Um, so prepared to be stretched and expect it. And like in gymnastics, you, People are going to get injured. You're going to get injured. So what are you going to do so that when that happens, you know, you can you can bounce back as fast as possible. I like that with the injury. Um, that's definitely something you do in sports. You try to prevent injuries. You're ahead of the injury. You don't wait till it's too late. As a for future medical students, I mean, we came into this field to help others and care for others. And there's not much we can do while we're still learning, except we can look out for one another. Mm -hmm. So I would say to those first year students, you start practicing, start looking out for, any, for each other, start looking for those signs that someone's struggling and be that person to support them. Um, not only to help, because it's what you want to do, it's basically your, it's the field you're going into, but it'll help you recognize those signs for the future. Um, be willing to listen to what they have to say instead of talk to, or tell them your perspective too quickly. And then finally, as a student, you feel overwhelmed with the amount of time you have. Mm -hmm. And it's too easy to feel like, you know what, I, I just don't have time to see a doctor. I just don't have time to prioritize my mental health. I, I got to study for this test. And you really do have that one hour, two hours, whatever it needs. Um, you can find it. I, I, I know it's tough, but it, it's not something to put in that back pocket or that, you know, put it to later. It's, it's something to get after early in your medical school education because um, like Jordan, like everyone's experience, it does happen. Everyone does have struggles, whether it's in your first two years, um, from my understanding, it can happen <laughs> anytime, all the way up. Even if you're a whiz in school and all academics way. come easy, it might be that patient, Very it might awesome. be. <laughs> so that would be my advice. Yeah, those are both extremely helpful tips. And I'm sure everyone listening, whether you're a med student, a resident, or anyone else, I'm sure they could get something out of that. I love looking out for one another. That's something we could all do. And definitely making sure you're taking care of yourself because that analogy of the oxygen mask is just, it's silly, but it's true. So it's so good to remind yourself of that. Um, so another question, kind of getting at both of your perspectives. Um, so. Dr. Spencer, you're a third year resident now. And after that experience, I'm just curious to hear what, what you think residency programs may be able to do to better support the mental health of their trainees. 
And Tanner, similarly, you know, you've gone through your first year of medical school now. Um, so what do you think medical schools could do to further prioritize and protect their students' mental health? <laughs> um, you're, you're asking the million dollar question. Um, Cause what you're asking me is how do we, how do we fix the- Fix the, the system, Jordan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we fix <laughs> the healthcare system? Um, making it so that we've got systems where like when residents are working, they're working and they're being doctors. They're really and truly having the human experiences um, because that's what you want them to be doing anyway, because that's when they leave, that's how they're gonna be good doctors. Um, yes, do they have to know how to write notes? Absolutely, that's important. Um, yes, do they have to know the inter like how, how a hospital works and functions? Absolutely. But I think sometimes it's, um, it's a lot easier to let things kind of be absorbed by your, your residents as opposed to really protecting them from some, like, cause the residents are gonna make sure the job gets done. They're, at the end of the day, we we're just built to do that. We can't, we can't go home until all the things are done. And so if, if, if you let us, we will kind of go into zones that really aren't our, our thing, but we do it because that's what has to happen. Build a structure so that that doesn't have to be the case. Um, then, then we're more efficient, then we're enjoying ourselves more than we're, you know, doing everything that, um, that we kind of envisioned. Um, and it's easier said than done. I know that this is, you know, easy for me to sit here and say that. And then it's a whole nother thing to flip an entire department and hire the extra hands to do things. But anyway. Well, I think you're on, on track though, because I've heard a lot of the cause that physicians say that burns them out is having to do a lot of paperwork or tasks that take them away, take them away from actual patient care. So yes, I think you're, I think you're on onto something there. <laughs> And Tanner, from the med side, med school side, what do you think they could do to help students? Yeah, um, like Jordan said, this can be a tough question, but I, um, I believe they med schools can do a good job. As students, we come in and we we don't feel like we know a whole lot, so we really trust the medical school institution to teach us. So the more they can normalize mental health. Um, the more we feel comfortable seeking it out. If it's if you're feeling like you're the only one looking out for it or you're the only one getting help, you feel kind of ostracized from your classmates, you may feel like you're you're not as good as them or you're not as capable as them. So I feel like if a medical school can just normalize it and say, hey, it's, it's this is a normal experience, this is something everyone goes through, it can kind of help people be more willing to look seek out that help, seek out that um, advice from others. The other thing is, um, Jordan helped me a lot with this. Um, everyone in school is smart, <laughs> everyone in school. And some of the hardest things are you study your guts out for a test and the average is really high. And sometimes you're like, I'm doing great. I did above the average. And you have that little, that good feeling. And sometimes you study your guts out and you go below the average and you feel like you can't do this. and you feel like you couldn't have put in more effort, you couldn't have put in more, and maybe you're not meant to be a doctor. And Jordan did a good job kind of reminding me through my first year that you may, you, you, you're gonna have those challenges, but as long as you're still learning every day, as long as you're still um, better than you were the day before, as long as you're, you're progressing in your knowledge of how to be a doctor, then you can't really be too upset with yourself. Yeah, I love that perspective too. I feel like if there are any residency programs or colleges out there, it's good advice for them just to take into consideration. Um, so my final question, again, this could be for either of you, both of you, whoever feels like answering. Um, so unfortunately, yes, there does continue to be a stigma around mental health issues, and that is especially true in the medical field. So what is one small action that everyone can take this Mental Health Awareness Month to help reduce this uh, this stigma, even if it's on a smaller scale. So, I would challenge whoever's listening and watching: um, try to have just one conversation about mental health with someone, um, about your mental health with someone. 
Um, again, have it in the appropriate way. Don't, don't, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> but um, you will be pleasantly surprised. I'm, I'm pretty open. I, I, saw, I saw a psychiatrist yesterday. So how about that? Um, and you will be very pleasantly surprised that when you open up about something like that, a lot of people, some who you'd never expect, um, will be like, yeah, that's, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, bring a, I bring one of those like sad lamps, one of those like bright light therapy lamps to work every day because um, it gives me energy. <laughs> and, and because I did med school where there's so many clouds, you can't even see, you never see the sun. Um, and that's open by virtue of having that, I've had a lot of conversations with people about mood. Um, and it's very fulfilling to have those kind of conversations. Um, and it's also very um, rewarding. It, you, you kind of feel like you're, you're giving a piece of you to that person and then, and they give a piece of themselves. And so you get this kind of like, again, those, those human connections, like true, real conversations. Um, and they don't have to be deep and whatever, but anyway, I challenge you to just have one conversation sometime this month um, with someone about mental health um, and just say it kind of like it's a normal thing because it is yeah. um, and uh, see where it gets you. That is really well said. I'm going to agree with him. You can't be an advocate for mental health if you go to others and you're like, I've never had a problem in my life. So this is a really important <laughs> subject. And so it's on you. And they're looking at you like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm fine too. There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> So I think definitely showing that you're, you know, you're a normal person and you, you, you too have had those struggles and to talk about ways to get through them and get past them is, is huge. And it can, it starts with one person. It starts with yeah. one meaningful contact with someone and it doesn't have to be some massive social media blitz. It can be Please just, don't. <laughs> Please don't. it can be that friend, you know, it could be that whoever coworker. So I agree. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's definitely a very actionable thing. And that I love how you said that makes your connections deeper. That's definitely true. When you can share something real, that'll, I don't know, enrich that relationship and build trust. So that's really beautiful. I love that. Um, and also, yeah, social media would be not be a great platform for that. I feel like that's where everyone's like, everything is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so. You can put a nice quote on there. Put a nice <laughs> Here's a sunset. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, honestly, it's been really a pleasure to speak with both of you. Thank you really so much for taking the time to talk with me today about this topic. Um, it's really an important issue, so it's deeply appreciated. And, you know, COVID-19, it truly really has brought mental health concerns to the forefront, I think, for a lot of people, not only medical professionals, but all of us, as we're all responding to the daily challenges, disruptions, loss, grief, you know, the list kind of goes on. Um, so if you're out there listening and you're inspired today, like I was honestly by Dr. Spencer and by Tanner, um, there is a way you can advocate on behalf of medical professionals, mental health um, through ACOM's Action Center. Uh, you can urge your members of Congress to sign on to the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act. And that is legislation that aims to reduce and prevent suicide, burnout and mental and behavioral health, health conditions among healthcare professionals. And as you may know, the bill is named after Dr. Lorna Breen, who was the New York City emergency room physician who died by suicide after treating COVID patients. Um, so the link to our action center is www.acom.org slash advocacy slash action hyphen center. And we can also post the link directly to the alert below. Um, so that is one small action you can take uh, to tweet your member of Congress, write them a letter um, to you know, pass this important bill. So I encourage everyone to do that. And thank you both once again, uh, Dr. Spencer and Tanner. It really has been a great um, experience speaking with you both and it's very much appreciated. Thank and thank you to everyone listening today. Uh, be well. <laughs>